What's up, s'mores? I'm Shannon Morris. Welcome to my YouTube channel, all about tech news, reviews, and tutorials. Now today it is all about the Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus, and I am so excited to check this out because I have been a Samsung fan for quite some time. Now my first Android device way back in the day after I had a Palm Centro, and then I went over to iPhone for a while, well, I got the Samsung Note 4. And then since then, I have switched over to the OnePlus devices. I had Google Nexus phones back in the day and then eventually updated to the Pixel line. Now I have missed some of the features of the Samsung phones like the grand line of cameras and the in-screen fingerprint sensor, which is pretty awesome. But honestly, after using the S20 Plus for a month, I'm kind of ready to go back to my Google Pixel 4 XL as opposed to my impressions of positivity that I had about the Note 10 last year in 2019. So this is the S20 Plus. It released on March 6th, right before I moved to Colorado, so I used it throughout my move. It starts at $1199.99 for the 128 gig model or $1349.99 for the 512 gig model, and it comes in cosmic gray, cloud blue, which is the pretty one you see here that has all my fingerprints on the back of it, and there's also cosmic black. Now, 1200 is kind of expensive for a phone, but they do have so many trade-in options that it'd be pretty easy to not pay full price. Plus phones drop in price after a few months anyway, so there's really no reason why you would ever have to pay $1,200 up front. In fact, I traded in a phone, so I got this one for about $600 as opposed to $1,200, so I got it for about half off. Plus, Samsung now has a buyback program, so you can get a credit worth 50% of the retail price of the product whenever you return turn the device in good condition within 24 months. Now, if that does not tell you how much of these phones are actually just mere profit, then I don't know what will. These also offer freebies like headphones right now. I got the Galaxy Buds Plus with mine. If you want to see a review of those, I can do a review of those headphones too. So the Galaxy S20 Plus, I'm going to unlock it again. It has 5G capabilities as well as a smooth display just like the Ultra. It does miss out on the upgraded cameras that you get with the Ultra, but you do get pretty much everything else. Now, as far as 5G goes, it supports low band and high band 5G frequencies, AKA millimeter wave and sub six. If you want to hear more about 5G and why that matters, let me know down in the comments below. I would love to do a tutorial or a segment all about what 5G is and what is the best option uh, if you are interested, so let me know. The S20 Plus is 6.7 inches. It's large, but it's not unbearably so. I can hold it pretty comfortably in my hand, but I do have to use both of my hands sometimes, especially if I'm taking certain photos. I did also have to add an additional shutter press right there, that little additional white button, just so I can take pictures with one hand, which is kind of ridiculous, but I'm glad they included that little feature. Now looking at the build, you will notice that there is no headphone jack whatsoever. It's only USB-C. I will go into charging in the battery in a little bit, but first I wanted to focus on like the camera and stuff like that. Uh, so you do have dual speakers as well. They are very loud. They are very clear. It's very easy to listen to things like a speaker phone call or YouTube videos. So I had no issues with that. I really appreciate when I have dual speakers on a phone. Uh, and the first thing that I really wanted to get into with this review, since I know everybody's going to ask about it, is camera tests. So since we are social distancing, I was not able to take this phone out with me to any bars or like artsy galleries like I normally would for a test. So I did what I could with what I have at home. With that said, I can give you an honest perspective via some family photos that I took before we went on lockdown to more recent pictures in March and April around my house. So the first thing I will mention with the camera is that it just kind of sucks. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> the S20 Plus can take photos up to 64 megapixels with zoom capabilities of 30 times digital with a three times optical zoom. You can also save raw and JPEG photos. You do have that option in the settings, which I appreciate because I do like taking raws and then editing them in Adobe. If you want to take that 64 megapixel photo though, you do have to switch from the 16 by nine aspect ratio over to three by four aspect ratio. And then you can only do one time to six times zoom if you're in that different aspect ratio. So it's, it's kind of a give or take whether you want 64 megapixels or you want the super, super zoom. Now they do have a bunch of optional features as well. There's panorama, there's food, live focus, which is kind of like portraits, live focus video, super slow mode, slow motion, hyperlapse, there's a night mode, pro and pro video. I'm not gonna be going through every single one of those features, but I will show you a few examples here and there. Uh, they're pretty self-explanatory and most of them are pretty average. So nothing super exciting to talk about there. One feature that I really like is this application called single take and it's really easy to just swipe over and choose single take whenever you're in the camera application so single take will take standard photos live focus stills video and gifs or gifs all at once and it sticks all of them into an album that's ai curated for the best shots in your gallery application now the s20 plus also has this sensor built into the back of it it's called time of flight and that's basically like the big up upgrade if you're going from the S20 to the S20 Plus. Now this sensor is 0.3 megapixels, it's f1.0 aperture, and it does things like measuring the depth for better portraits and better AR effects. Does it help? Well, I don't have an S20 to test it against, so I can't tell you if upgrading from an S20 to an S20 Plus is good just for the TOF sensor, or if it's not worth the additional money. Regular wide is 12 megapixels, that's your normal mode, and that's f1.8 aperture, 26 millimeter camera lens, and 1.8 microns. The telephoto lens is 64 megapixels, so that's the 64 megapixel one that I had mentioned. That one is f2.0 aperture and 0.8 microns, and it also has that three times hybrid optical zoom. Ultra wide is 12 megapixels, f2.2, so still a really good aperture. It's a 13 millimeter lens at 1.4 microns. So with all of these cool features, why do I think it sucks? Well, I did have some issues with the pictures. I'll get into some examples, but I also thought that the camera app itself had some issues. So the shutter seems a little bit delayed compared with my Pixel 4 XL, and autofocus was a little iffy at times. Now I should mention, this is version 10.0.01.98 of the camera application, which is supposed to fix the slow autofocus. This is the version of the app that I currently have, and I really don't think that it's still satisfactory, especially for a phone that's $1,200. Now I do have some examples that I will go into here of exposure, like white balance. It's pretty accurate during the day, but it does try to make yellows pop way too much. Like these two examples of Starbuck taken a split second between show the differences when it just tries too hard. And the original photo was so natural. So I don't know why it decided to add in all these yellow colors to the base of this photo. When I'm focusing on details, it is quite good, especially especially with the 64 megapixels, but I gotta say that details overall were quite satisfactory. So I was pretty happy with the details of these photos, especially when I was taking pictures of my cats. The color accuracy, again, can be good, but other times it can be kind of a negative. If you are working with low light, I did notice that it made those yellows absolutely pop quite a bit as compared to bright light in the middle of the day. And even with HDR, which is automatic, and even if I disable or enabled it and tried different modes. I noticed that the exposure sometimes made the whites of clouds and things like that just overexposed. So I was not super impressed with HDR when compared to my Pixel 4 XL. With portraits, I gotta say that it did pretty good. I noticed that it did a good job, even though I have quite a bit of hair around my face. So it was able to draw those out, maybe because of that time of flight sensor and take that portrait mode correctly with the correct depth. Now, I do want to give a mention to night mode, which was 
basically terrible. Uh, I think that the Pixel 4 XL really, really hit the ball out of the park with the night mode. And moving over to the S20 Plus, I was just not, not happy with it at all. It just did not seem to do a good job and I was not impressed. <laughs> Uh, it does a good job in low light for the most part, except for those like yellow issues. But when it comes to night mode, it's just, ah, uh -uh. no, not good. Now let's discuss recording video with this thing. You can record up to 8K at 24 FPS. You can also do UHD or Full HD up to 60 FPS, all at 16 by nine aspect ratio. Or you can switch to a square crop, or you can also do full 2400 by 1080. It does a couple of different modes. There's HEVC or MPEG formats included. Now, anytime I'm recording video on a phone, I am always curious if I could actually use this thing to record podcasts or record videos for my YouTube channel. But when I listened back to the microphone, I thought it was kind of terrible. And that's with zoom in mic enabled or with zoom in mic disabled. Now zoom in mic is this little feature that they have included, which means if you zoom in during your recording, it will also zoom the mic to match how far you're zoomed in in the video. It's very, very strange and it feels kind of out of body almost with the experience of listening to that. I did not like it, so I usually had that disabled, and I even still felt like the microphone that's built into this was just not very good. So I would absolutely recommend using an external mic if you choose to record professional videos on this camera, if you want to use 8K or even 4K. So this is a test of the internal mic on the Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus uh, outside. So you hear a lot of audio around me and uh, this will give you a good test of what it sounds like whenever I'm talking. Hey everyone, this is Shannon Morris and I'm doing a microphone test of the internal mic on the Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus. Now the front facing camera on this is a dual 10 megapixel f2.2, 26 millimeter, 1.22 micron sensor and lens. It can do video up to 2160p at 30 or 60 FPS, as well as 1080p at 30 FPS. As far as taking portraits, I was pretty happy with it. I have to say that the widescreen on here was just at that bare minimum of being wide enough that I can take a selfie with somebody else and the portrait modes on it did look quite good as well. It did create this beauty mode automatically on your face, which makes you look a little bit uncanny valley, and I sometimes prefer to have a much more natural look with selfies. So take that as you will. That's one thing that will definitely depend on what you prefer. Let's move on to the screen and the display. This is an AMOLED display. I do have it set to 120 hertz, which you can definitely tell whenever I'm in the app drawer because it's so incredibly smooth to use and it's incredibly fast. It is beautiful and it is very tough to go back to 60 hertz displays after using that, but that's only 120 hertz at 1080p resolution, not the native 3200 by 1440 pixels, the QHD+. If you wanna use 1440p, you have to go back down to 60 hertz. So keep that in mind if you want one or the other. It feels like you just can't have the best of both worlds. This is an aspect ratio of 20 by 9 with 525 pixels per inch. Now the high brightness mode, which is installed on here automatically, that lets you hit between 823 to 1342 nits brightness, which is really, really bright. Now the fingerprint sensor on here to unlock the phone kind of sucks. A lot of times it tells me to press it harder. I've had this thing for a month. I've been using it for a long time. And a lot of times it just does not recognize my 
it does not recognize my finger. It's slow, it does not register very quickly, and honestly, it feels crappier than the one in the Note 10 or the one in the OnePlus phones. Apparently, they switched to new technology in the S20. Instead of the ultrasonic reader in the Note 10, it is supposed to be more secure, but it's kind of slow, so... Again, you can't have the best of both worlds. Facial recognition is also available in these phones too, but again, if you are using facial recognition and you choose to not turn on the fingerprint sensor, sometimes with secure apps, that just does not work because some applications don't have facial recognition enabled. Now this has the Snapdragon 865 processor, which has 12 gigs of RAM included in it as well. That keeps things super snappy. Android 10 is included too already installed for your enjoyment so you can do things like gestures and dark mode all of that's included since all of that comes with Android 10. But instead of having that vanilla Android experience, you have One UI, which is the operating system from Samsung. Now, when I was using this, I have to say it was quite easy to use. The UI is very, very natural. I had no issues finding what I needed to find. So if you are switching from vanilla Android over to One UI with Samsung, then you should not have any issues switching from one to the other. Now, of course, I did want to mention in the battery too. It's a 4,500 milliampere hour battery. And with the screen set to 120 hertz, pretty much all the time, I get about seven to eight hours of usage from a normal day. That's my on-screen time. Now I have to say that this could be better, but it's also set at 120 hertz. So I was expecting that to lower the battery quality of this phone since I was increasing the smoothness of the display. That's obviously going to lower some of that battery life. Wireless charging is also included in here. There's a 25 watt USB-C Samsung charger charger, which is in the box. It also supports fast wireless charging 2.0, so you can use this with a fast wireless charger. You can also charge other devices using Samsung's wireless power share via Qi charging. That's QI for Qi. Now, if you set something on the back of this that is a Qi charging capable phone or other kind of device, like maybe your Galaxy Buds Plus, then you can set those on the back of this and charge those through that power share. I thought that was such a cool cool feature. That's something that is very useful, especially if you're on the go, you're on a plane, etc, etc, and you don't have a spare battery to plug those things into. The last thing that I went in to mention was call quality. Now with the calling on this, I'm using Google Fi. Whenever I want to review call quality, I am going to mention this absolutely depends on not only your carrier, but also your phone. So even though I had a good experience with this, my phone calls were clear, I had no issues, that doesn't necessarily mean that your carrier will be absolutely 100% the same. So keep that in mind when I say that this one was very clear, it was very easy to use. However, I'm not in an area with 5G, so I was not able to use that feature since I am self-isolating. So that's a thing. Uh, but with all of that said, I've used this phone for 30 days. I've had it for a month. I purchased it myself. I was very curious if I would like this as much as it was really hyped up to be, but but I would not buy this phone at full price. Sorry guys, I know there's a lot of Samsung fans out there, but I wouldn't buy it at full price. The, just the camera, it's not worth it. It feels lower quality than the camera in the Pixel line, even though the Pixel's older. I love the display. I love the intuitive OS, even though vanilla is always my favorite. And snappy, snappy usage. But the camera really keeps me from saying like, buy this thing, it's amazing. If the camera was top quality, then I would be sold, but it's not. And that's really holding me back. And again, I feel like there's so many compromises that I had to make with this phone. If I wanted 120 Hertz, I couldn't get full resolution, for example. If I wanted to do 64 megapixels, I couldn't get the right aspect ratio that I would prefer. So there's all sorts of different things that are compromises. And you shouldn't be compromising on a phone that is MSRP, $1,200. So if you want to buy this phone, cool, but 
don't pay full price. Now, if I upset anybody out there about my review, maybe you disagree with me about some parts of this review, that's totally fine, and I would love to hear your comments down below. I would also like to know if you agree with anything that I mentioned in this video, or if you had any questions about features or different products, specs that I did not mention in this video. Put those down in the comments. I would love to answer all of them for you. And again, thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you for your support. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.